The anointing pulls you out. Shake it, man. There you go. See, the anointing pulls it out. Goodbye. Goodbye. See, see, go, go, go. The anointing pulls it out. See, 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 see. see. Up and out. Up and out. Up and out. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Come out. Come out. Come out. You release him. Come out. Come out. Now. I break the generational curse. I break the generational curse. Bye-bye. Release him. The generational curse. I break the generational curse. Now. 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 Jesus name. Loose him and let him go. Now, Jesus' name. Welcome to the Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. A quick reminder that the Father State is now on locals.com. So click the link in the description to support our work. And thank you all in advance. I do appreciate it. Also, remember you can support the Father State by joining our channel membership on YouTube. All right? Gracias. I appreciate that. Mama Mia. I have with me Pastor Alexander Pagani. Pagani. He is an author and apostolic Bible teacher and founder of Amazing Church That's Glo right. Global. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me on. Listen, I got to be honest with you. I'm getting texts by everybody saying, oh boy, you know, so there's a lot of fans that that follow your show in New York City. So they're anticipating this interview to be quite, quite interesting. So thank <laughs> what, you for uh, having me on. How do they know about it? We, uh, <laughs> we this is not, a, this is pre-recorded. Listen, a lot of people know who you are. Amazing. You know, you know so your interviews are pretty famous concerning the walk-offs uh, in <laughs> mid-interviews. So nice. that's kind of like how I got privy to you a couple, maybe about two years ago. And um, just thank you for having me on. So I thank you for coming on. And so your last name is Pagani, but you look black. <laughs> I'm actually Afro Latino. I'm Puerto Rican. My grandmother's grandparents uh, were slaves, brought from Africa to Puerto Rico. So I'm probably the lightest, one of the few light skin shade in my family. So it's a mixture of Latino and African, and then some Italian in there and French. So wow, what a mess. Yeah, I'm all messed up. <laughs> and, I, I, uh, and are you married to an Afro-Latino? Actually, my wife is Puerto Rican. Um, and she has more of an Irish and a more of a Jewish uh, bloodline than more than oh, I do. Wow. So, yeah. And so, so what yeah. your children going to come out to be like? My children is all messed up. Right now. <laughs> I have a 29-year-old and I have a 20-year-old. So, yeah, they, 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 they you know. Oh, amazing. Well, welcome to the show. How did you and when did you become a pastor? Well, I got called to the pastorate while serving nine years in prison. That's where I got saved at. I got saved in jail. I was sentenced to nine years in prison and I had a supernatural. I know many, many viewers might not necessarily agree with such religious experiences uh, for the disbelief that the U.S pretty much is in now, but I did have a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ in my cell. Um, and he spoke to me in my right ear and said, follow me. And I, be, I repented of my sin. I got born again while in prison, um, didn't go home. So it wasn't like a jailhouse religion thing. And um, while, I, while I was serving out my prison sentence, I had a unique desire to get into the word, into the area of apologetics. Um, and really deep Bible study. Then I started having dreams and visions within prison that would be pastoring people. And then here we are. I got released in 1998, been serving in ministry in every church that I've been a member of. And then uh, around 2003, 2001, we started, uh, we took over our established church. And from that time until now, we've been pastoring. So this May makes 20 years serving as, 
as lead pastor of a church. That's amazing. And so when you say you got saved, what does that mean exactly? Well, I became immensely aware, aware of my sinfulness and my need, my desperate need for a savior that I could only find in Christ Jesus from the scriptures. So I, I, I don't, I didn't grow up in church. So I don't know like this other version of Jesus that's kind of out there, like the more commercialized, popularized Jesus. Right. I just knew the Jesus of the Bible and that was it. And it made sense to me. And um, I repented and I followed the Romans chapter 10. I confessed him as Lord. And I, I believe that God raised him from the dead. And uh, I had like this born again, regenerate experience that from that day up until now, cigarettes, pornography, everything, everything just supernaturally left. And I know that everybody's experience is like that, not like that. Some right. people's progress in a process. Mine was instantaneous. Um, and yeah, this is, I've been serving the Lord since 1992, 30 years in the gospel. And so were you saved from of the heart or saved from the vices? I was saved from the heart. And, um, and so the vices came later. Yeah. You know, it wasn't behavior modification. It was, well, heart transformation. And the vices just kind of left. I wasn't looking to get free from the vices. I was looking to get free from sin. That's the real God honest truth. When that moment happened, I wasn't thinking about that I smoke and I drink. I right. wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about that I'm a sinner and I'm on my way to hell. And I just knew that I deserved to go there, you know, and that just wasn't something that was in my conscience up until that point. So just very, very unique experience. But and so you were saved from the heart. Uh, yeah. And what does it mean to be saved from the heart, of the heart, salvation of the heart? What does that mean? Well, it means to have your unregenerate heart that is born in sin, um, to be completely regenerated, which means a metamorphosis, means completely transformed from darkness, dead, inactive, not alive, to becoming alive, washed by the blood and, you know, the, the salvation experience. So, um, yeah. And so you no longer have anger? Whoa, yeah, I think I can I, I can get angry a little bit there. Yeah, I think I can I got some anger. I think most Christians got some anger issues. Yeah, and so. why if Christians are saved because salvation is of the heart, right? If Christians are saved from the heart, how can you be of God and of the devil? Because God is of love and Satan is of anger. How can you serve both? Well, when the salvation experience breaks the power of sin, not the presence of sin. It just breaks the power of it, which means I have the ability now to say no because the Holy Spirit's living on the inside. It doesn't necessarily remove the presence of those sins. It's just that I now have the ability to say no. So be angry, sin not, which means you're not, you're not going to like not be angry. The Bible is actually telling you, you're going to get angry. Just don't sin. So that's how I view it according to how it's been revealed to me through scripture that the salvation experience doesn't remove the presence. It doesn't remove the presence of sin. It just removes the power. But anyone that has anyone that has anger is of their father, the devil. And, and God says that anyone that has anger is a murderer and that yeah. you should never trust an angry person. And so why didn't God take the spirit of the devil from your heart if you were born of the heart? Well, I guess right now it's just word semantics. I wouldn't say that I'm given over to anger, but to say that someone, if they get angry one time, let's say I'm angry about something that's minuscule, you know, saying the, the check cash register person didn't give me the correct change and I got angry. I'm of the devil. Like that don't make no, that don't, that don't make no sense. That's, that's more <laughs> legalism. That's legalism at its finest. And what, what do you mean by legalism? I don't know what that is. That means a literal, that means a literal interpretation, letter of the law. You're following exactly how it's written and not understanding the spirit of the law. Meaning like, it's just, so then every time you get angry, you're of the devil. So every time you sin, you're of the devil. The first John chapter one says you're going to sin. So there's a problem there. So if first John chapter one says, if we sin, we have an advocate. Why didn't John just say, when you sin, you are of the devil? Like you're of the devil, you're of Satan. There's no, there's nowhere in that verse. So, but if you're a literalist, then, then I'm the, then I'm of the devil. There's no way around that one. I own it. I'm from the Bronx. You know, like <laughs> I guess I'm from the devil, you know, it's, like, but God it's, not said, scri it's not scriptural, but, but I God said if anyone somebody. sin, meaning if you have anything, if anyone sin, they are of the devil, not of him. 
No, that's not what it says. It says that if anyone, if anyone says that he's of God and yet he sins, he a liar and the truth is not in him. For that reason, Christ came that you might not sin. Okay, so now you're t- you're going back on what you just said. You just said if you sin, you have the devil. Now you now you're on my side. So now that what you're, do you mean? Now you're on my side. No, I'm saying, saying that you cannot exactly have. I'm yeah. saying you cannot have the spirit of the devil in you and be of God too, because you can't serve two masters. Let me ask, do you believe that God has anger? I believe he has righteous, righteous indignation, not anger. Anger, I believe, would be a human emotion, but I believe the scripture says he has righteous indignation, which means it's more pertinent to the legalities of who he is as a judge. So in, indignation is different than anger. Anger is personalized. That's human. That's you and I. We get angry. I don't get angry. I never get angry because he took the spirit of the anger away from me. 30, 33 years ago, and I, I mean, gone through so many issues since then, but I never get angry. Right. Because right. I don't have the spirit of the devil in my heart anymore. I hear you. Then you don't get angry. Right. Because perfect <laughs> love. I can say. Perfect love casts all out. Let me ask. Um, yeah. Did you go and forgive your mother for turning you away from your father? Uh, my mother's a member of my church. I authentically have forgiven my mother. My mother and my dad are both divorced, but they're serving the Lord as members of my house and they have a great relationship. They're not remarried. Um, they both haven't remarried. Um, and I oh, forgave my mom a long time ago and both my parents and my parents forgave me. And it's beautiful in our church right now. And so you forgave her for imposing her will on you? No, I just forgave her for maybe the upbringing that I felt was unjustified that probably could have been a lot better. And that led to me getting to jail at the age of 14. I think I went to jail at 14 initially. So and when you told her, prison, so, yeah. when you told her that you forgive her for imposing will on you and turning you away from your father, what did she say? She said, well, well, I didn't forgive her for something like that. That wasn't specifically what I was forgiving her for. I was forgiving my mom for uh, being a drug addict. She was a drug abuser. So I was forgiving her more for, uh, living that drug abuse lifestyle. But there was a time that I did bring up my dad. Now, my dad has been off and on in my life. Well, he's a member of my church now, so he's in my, he serves in the leadership of my church now as a, you know, as a minister of the gospel. But um, there was a moment where my, I did bring that up, you know, and then my mom began to tell me the other side of the story that I had not known. Yeah. And it, it just became a little bit more clear. And then I understood maybe the decisions that she might have made. And did you forgive your father for not protecting you from her? No, that didn't, that didn't come up. I didn't have an issue with my dad about that. Like that stuff don't, that, that don't bother me. When you, when you ask him, why didn't he protect you growing up? When you ask him, why don't you protect me from her? What would he say? I have no idea because I don't care. That's not something that I was desiring. I wasn't that type of child looking for that. Oh, you you never, oh, oh, I see. So growing up. You never wonder why doesn't my father, why won't my father uh, protect me from, this, from my mother? Nope. I was a monster in the street. I didn't care. I'm going to be very honest with you. Yeah. I was that guy that I didn't care. So I was never thinking about my parents and never thinking. I wasn't that young man who needed a father figure in his life. I could care less about that stuff. I did my own thing. That's not what I forgave him for. You, know so you didn't love him when growing up. You didn't love your father. You didn't yearn nope. for him. Nope. You hated no him. Yearning for him. You hated nope. him. I didn't hate him. I just didn't care. I was, I didn't care. I never thought about it. So I never had the chance to care. So I didn't have that, man, my dad wasn't there for me. Like I just, I didn't care. I was running the streets. I didn't care. It, it never came up. I never sat there and thought about it. I've to this day, I've never thought about it. Like we reconciled. He, he's, I'm a Christian. He's a Christian now and we've moved on. So I, I'm just not that I don't know. I, I eat. I eat. When I was in the street, I would eat young young guys like that that had that need of a father figure. Those are the guys that I would bully. <laughs> really? so I never. I never had that. I never yeah. had that that desire to be with a dad. And I just that's not me, man. So that, you were a bad. Definitely. You were like a bad guy growing up, like a gang member or something. You know, like one hundred percent is why I went to prison and got sentenced to nine years. So wow. I was that guy. I was the guy doing black on black crime. I that's straight up did it. I didn't care. 
That's amazing. I black crime. I didn't care. So you were born and raised in New York? In the Bronx. Oh, okay. That's amazing. One other question. Did you know that yeah. it, the anger of a, that of a man is that of a woman because it's abnormal for men to be angry? And so any man that's angry has his mother identity. He's been recreating her image. I never heard of that. <laughs> so that's, that's why, new to me. That's, that's why God me. said that anyone, everyone who was born of the woman must be born of the spirit of the father. You must return to the father. Let me, that, I, that I do agree with you on, because the Bible talks about the spirit of adoption returning back to the father. So yeah. 100%, yeah. Amazing. So you're married, right? Yes. And does your wife obey you? Yes. She obey? Yeah. Nice. 100%. My wife, um, I, well, I don't impose as much as the chauvinistic type of thing, but my wife is one of the few last dying breeds that she follows me. You know, I'm the high priest of this house spiritually, and she supports me. And I'm like, God says, let's go this way. She's like, let me pray about it. Let's go. You know, I've never had that resistance with my wife. I absolutely adore my wife. I, she's a keeper. You know, and, she's from the old school. She's from the old school. Nice, she's, not man. New, she's not this new ones that you got to be like convincing. My wife is just a, an amazing, an amazing individual. And everybody in the church will tell you, tell you so. Not just because I'm saying it, but because right. she's, the last, she's the last of a dying breed. Nice. Is she younger than you? No, she's older than me. What the? Yeah. How many years? Three years. Wow. A man yeah. should never marry a woman older than him. <laughs> I didn't know that 20, 24 years ago. I didn't know that. So. You end up marrying your mama and, and older women, uh, are, uh, you know, they have a lot of issues. So it's like buying a used car or something. I've heard about that. I've seen the statistics on that. The young boys marry their mamas. Yeah. I didn't grow up with my mamas in that regards because at the age of 14 through 22, I was in prison. So I don't know what that is. So I don't think that applies to me because I didn't have enough time to be raised by my mom to know what my mom right. would, be, would be like. Okay. But yeah. What, um, how do you deal with the hell in your wife when it comes out? You know, sometimes she's just mad about nothing. You wake up smiling in the morning because you had a nice sleep, <laughs> and she's already looking at you angry. What are you, what are you smiling for? How do you deal with the hell when it comes out of her? You know, <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that question because <laughs> I haven't really seen that. Not the hell part. I've seen normal morning stuff, you know. She would tell you that I'm the... It truly is. I, I'm the happy camper in the morning. I'm, yeah, I'm, men really are normally like happy ones and women are ticked by nothing. And that's what I'm asking <laughs> so other men would know, how do you deal with the hell in her when it comes out? She doesn't, you know, I'm not trying to evade the question, but I haven't seen the hell, but I wouldn't want to see it. You know, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't want to see it. I, I'm sure every person has hell in them somewhere, but I, I just haven't had a chance. I just haven't had a chance to see that. I would say this. I'm a little bit more perkier and a little bit more joyful in the morning because yeah. I just I'm enjoying life. I really am enjoying life. I could right have been on. dead. I can you tell, know? man. I can tell. Um, did you know, do you agree with me that the, that the God below is the woman's God and the God above is the man's God. I don't know what that means. You're like going to have to explain that to me right now. Like Satan is the woman's God and God, God, the God above and the God in us is the man's God. And it's the, it's the uh, role of the man to bring the woman out of the hell that she's living in and not go into her hell. And because every time the man listens to the woman, he suffers because Satan is her daddy. Okay, so that sounds like false doctrine. So oh. I would say 100%. No, that sounds like some esoteric, Masonic type of Babylonian. I don't know what that sounds like, but it sounds <laughs> like something along those lines. So I wouldn't, I would say that's false doctrine. Oh, you know okay. So what it is. Okay, so in the beginning, is it true that Adam and his father was one? And then one day the father decided, you know what? I'm tired of creating. I'm tired of creating human being with my hand from the dust. So I'm gonna make a woman from Adam, so that she can have some babies. And when, <laughs> when <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta laugh. This is this sounds like theological parody, man. Like this is where are you getting? This is the, that's the goofiest thing I've ever heard. 
it, but it's funny and it's hilarious and it just makes great content. I, I don't even know how to answer that. But I know? haven't like, finished yet. But <laughs> isn't it true that God and Adam had a tight relationship and then he made the woman and the woman had a tight relationship with her husband, Adam. Okay. And, and then one day she went shopping in the garden to get some greens and candy yams <laughs> and okras. And she met the devil in the, over there in the garden. And the devil was like, Eve, you don't have to listen to that man. You could be your own woman. And she was like, no, I'm going to listen to my husband. And so she went home and she told Adam that she had seen Satan in the garden. He was uh, trying to convince her to turn against him. And, and, and Adam was like, no, don't listen to this woman. I mean, don't listen to the devil. She said, all right. So she went back shopping again. And this time she, she, she bought some apples and things like that, right? <laughs> And then Satan said, you still listen to that man, Adam? She's like, yeah, don't listen to him. You could be your own woman. You can take your bra off. You can kill the babies in the womb. You could be free. And she's like, yeah, that's right. And she believed the serpent. And when she believed the serpent, she no longer could believe her man, her husband, Adam. And Satan became a god. And then she, Adam couldn't believe that she had listened to the devil. But now she wouldn't obey her husband. Because Satan was her God now. And then one day she made an apple pie and put a lot of mama love in it. <laughs> <laughs> and she put a lot of love in it and gave Adam a piece of the apple pie. And he listened to the woman and the woman became his God. And, and so, and that's why God threw him out of the garden because Adam had listened to the woman who had listened to the devil. Did that happen? <laughs> that has to be the most jacked up parable that I've ever heard concerning. That has to be like the ghetto version <laughs> of the story of Genesis. <laughs> That's a mixture of L.A. Compton and South Bronx <laughs> version of the story of the fall of mankind. <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that other than Reverend Jess, where you come up with this stuff? Like this, if this is the stuff swirling in your brain, oh my Lord, I, I don't even know how to answer that, sir. I don't so, know how to answer so that. Let me ask you this way. Did the woman listen to the devil? I'd say yes. And when she listened to the devil, did he become her God? You know, I never, I've, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know how to answer that because I don't, I would say yes in essence, but I don't see the consequence of that decision happening until Adam actually joined in that. And then you see, you know, the realization of sin. So I would say in essence, she was deceived. So yes, practically in, like, in the natural. Yeah. And then, and then, and then did Adam listen to the woman? Yes, he did. And as a result of listening to the woman, did the woman become his God? Okay, now that's a wordplay, and now that's a trick question. There, how is that so, a trick question? What the? I, I think I, I think it's a, I think it's a trick question. How is it a trick uh, question? It's, it's in the word. <laughs> it's in the word. <laughs> I know it's in the word, but I'm trying to figure out to what ends are you trying to get me to agree with you on? What is it that you're trying to get me to agree with you on? So I'm like, I'm playing with we're, we're both playing a chess game. So I'm like, okay. In essence, yes. But if I say yes, what am I actually saying yes to? You know? True. So that's kind of like, well, in that in that regards, then I can say, looking at it in the natural, then I would say yes. Right. I would say yes. That wouldn't be the the narrative perpetuated by Orthodox Christianity, but looking at it from the natural without excluding the religious aspect and the spiritual aspect of it, then I would say, I would say yes. In the natural, I would say yes. And then God said, because you listen to the woman, you shall suffer. Right. And so why do men listen to women nowadays? Because every time they listen to the woman, they suffer. I don't know how to answer that, but I would say that that's an accurate statement based on history. I would say that that's probably an accurate statement. To some degree, I would say yes. That's amazing, huh? I would say that would be that, that that's unfortunate, that that would be unfortunate. How about Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I would join you in amazing because that's the name of our church, Amazing Church. That's right. And that's why God said that we must be born again of the Father because everyone that comes through the woman, born through the woman, is born into that evil nature. 
Yes. And 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 we must be born of the spirit of the father. And yes. And unless men and women love their earthly father, they right. cannot love God. Because right. how can you say you love God? You've never seen him and hate your father. Right. I would say and add and add to that, you know, the last thing that the prophet Malachi said before the advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, I'm gonna send the prophet whose primary focus um, actually, it doesn't even say he would preach anything else other than turning the hearts of the fathers to the son and yeah. the hearts of the sons to the father. So Amazing. I would say, I would say yes. And the then, sons and the daughters, because yes. the daughters have to return to the father too. Right. Um, do you listen to your wife? I would listen. I would say yes. But you don't take her advice though, right? I ask her advice. So if I'm asking her advice, I'm already taking her advice if I'm asking it. Oh, and why do you, you ask her advice about evil things? I ask her advice on anything that I feel that I can't handle myself. I would say, as a joint heir with me, I would say, as a help me, what's your thoughts on this? I, I would like your input on this. And she'd give me her valuable thoughts. Why Many do you times think, they've been really good. Why do you think that preacher, men preachers allow women to become preachers and prophets and pastors and all that. When, why, why are the preachers so weak that they will allow women to be out of order like that? I guess it would probably mean, well, two reasons. One, um, that they, their personal belief system believes that, um, that women can be preachers. So if that's their belief system, then I can understand why that that would be the corresponding action. I, I guess the second reason I think uh, would would be is to try. This is from what I've seen. This is from what I've seen. Right. Is there because church has been so institutionalized, a lot of our present day ministers tend to do anything that's away from institutionalized religion. So they find themselves doing that. And it's not really because God sent them. It's because I just want to do something that the church said that I couldn't do. So I find that there's a lot, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of ministerial, uh, traditional Christian orthodoxy trauma that causes this new breed of ministers to feel like they just, they just want to do anything that is anti the colonizers. So they'll just, so if women can't preach and this is what the denominationalism says, I'm going to just do the opposite of that. So I'm going to make women preachers. So Amazing. I don't know exactly why they would do that, but I, these are two reasons that I would probably see if their belief system embraces that, then Yes, I can see why they would do that. It's part of their narrative, their theological narrative. And second is sometimes it's the secondary response of the church hurt of just trying to anger the church in doing that. Like prov they're, they're provoked, according to Ephesians chapter five, their children provoked to anger, but they're just angry at a system, at organized religion. And a lot of them are so weak. They have overcome the nature of their mothers. They're afraid not to let the woman be the preacher. And also... They want the money, so they appease the woman because she bring the she bring the she bring the money to church. You know what I mean? I would I would say yes. I don't have that narrative in our church. We have a solid group. We have a lot of men in our church. Right but on. Ideally, yes, the church is predominantly female and, and and women driven. I would say, yeah, I can I can see that. I can see that. Do you believe in the order of God and Christ, Christ and man? Man over woman and woman over children. Yes, I do. One hundred percent. I actually teach that, and I call it the four. Le I call it the four heads. You got Christ. You got God, Father. You got God, Jesus, Father, uh, wife, and then children. I actually teach that in our church. Right so on, I man. Say one hundred percent. Yes. Right on. What's uh? What is uh? Apostolic. Uh. Apostolic. What What does apostolic mean? Okay, it means that I'm of the belief system that I believe in all fivefold, present day fivefold, according to Ephesians chapter three, where he gave gifts unto men, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and the teacher, which means I believe in a fivefold model as opposed to the average evangelical church believes in a threefold model. They believe in evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I believe in modern day apostles and prophets. I'm even though I do believe that a lot of them that claim to be apostles are not, and a lot of them that claim to be prophets are charlatans, and many of them are just flat out deceived. Um, but I do believe that there is a group of people that, that operate in a modern day 
apostolic fivefold model. So it's just it's just what that means. I don't mean apostolic in like Jesus only, like a Geno Jennings, because that's an apostolic denomination. I'm referring to more of a fivefold model, modern day apostles and prophets. Are you a Christian? One hundred percent. I'm a follower of the way. Of the way. Um, it, is Jesus the Son of God or God? I believe he is the Son of God. Why do some people, a lot of, especially evangelical Christians and, and others, still believe that Jesus is God? Where did they do they get believe, that idea from? Yeah, but I do believe Jesus is God. I believe Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. But I do believe, I thought you was asking, do I believe in the person and the deity of Christ? So in that, in that regards, he's the Son of God, the only begotten of God. So, yeah. Let me I, restate. I'm orthodox in my belief system. I believe Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. Let me restate the question because I'm black and slow. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Latino and retarded a little bit. Like I'm a little bit, uh, you got to help me a little bit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so is Jesus the son of God or God? Son of God, God. And Three it, in one. And You're not going to get me to shake out of that. I know that sounds weird. I can't really fully explain it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Oh, I believe in I'm a Trinitarian. In the in the in the word, in the scriptures, in the word. Right. In the beginning right. there was the word. In the word. Right. Does Jesus say he's the Son or does he say I'm God? I believe that he says he is the Son, but when he's asked, is he God? He says, if you see me, you see, you see God. Because so he I, and his father are one, but he never said he was God. He, he said, my father sent me. He didn't say, I sent me. He said, my father sent me. Right. It, it, uh, clearly stating that God is God, his father, right. and he is the son, but he is not God. Right. Okay, so now you're getting into modalism, and modalism who, is a false doctrine, and that's who heresy. Who is modalism? Yeah, I don't modalism know is people. believing in God, one God, and then each per, each of the three of the Godhead are manifesting themselves in three different ways. But did uh, Jesus say that he is the Son, or he said, I'm the Father? He said he's, well, he said he's the Son. I am the Son of God. The Son proceeds from the Father, but then he also made it very clear that he said that he's also the Father. Where John, in, John, where, John chapter 14, verse 6 says that. You he said that it. I am God? He says, it, haven't I been so long time with you? Whoever sees me has seen the Father. Right, Proclaim but did he say, I am the Father? Yes, he did. But That's what he, he said. Did, he I am never the said, no, he said that if you see me, you see the Father because the Father is in me. And anyone who is born again of God, truly right. born of God, you will see the Father in them because the light will shine. But that doesn't mean that they are God. It does mean that they're God. 100%. Okay, so ask me this. This is just a war of etymology, a war of words based on translation. That's all we're doing he right now. He never said that, though. He actually authentically oh, said that. So one more question about that, I think. Yeah. When he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Was he He's talking to, to himself? The father. No, he was not talking to himself. <laughs> Who was he talking? Would he call he himself talking, Father? He was talking to the Father. And so another, another identity, right? Not himself. God in three persons. He was talking to his father, right? He was talking to his father. In Amazing. that instance, he was talking to his father. 100%. And so if he was God, why didn't he just say, I forgive y'all? I don't know why he didn't do that. Because he and wasn't a God, man. What the? You know, I don't know why he didn't do that, and I don't care. In the Bible, do does the Bible talk about Trinity? Does it mention the word Trinity? Absolutely not. And how did y'all come up with Trinity then? Night the Nicene Creed invented the concept of the term Trinity, and it is accepted by the established Orthodox Christian churches as a word that we've embraced. But the but word why, Trinity is not in the Bible. Why do you embrace it when it's not of the word? Because the concept is there. That's like me not saying, go read your Bible. I'm not going to tell somebody, no, go read your Bible. What am I going to say? Go read the Law of Moses. Go read the New Testament. I mean, you can't say that, but there's nothing wrong with saying, go read your Bible. See what I'm saying? So there's nothing wrong with saying, I believe in Trinity. It's just a word. It's, it really is just, it's just a word. But word can be deceiving. 
Well, I agree with you with that. A word can be deceiving, but the Trinity, the word Trinity is not deceiving. I think it's deceiving to this generation because we got transatlantic trauma and we just don't want anything that has to do with the colonizers. So I think that's a whole other topic there. But do you remember when Jesus said, why do y'all praise me, worship me? My father sent me. I'm doing my father's work. And right. he said, greater work shall you do. Right. Why would God, if he was God, why would he say greater work? Can we do greater works than God? We could do greater works than Jesus based but, on Jesus' own statement. Jesus but I understand God. what you mean. If he's God, then we could do greater works than God. This is nothing more than a wordplay of etymology, of origin of Who words. Who is etymology? Etymology means the origin of a word. That's what that oh. means. The word etymology means. I told the you I was black and slow. <laughs> you know, but now you're learning something. So this this slow guy from well, New York is teaching you something. Etymology means the origin of words, meaning how we develop words, the origin of a word. So what does this word mean? Where did it originate from? That's etymology. Where does that word come from? Well, so, why would Jesus deceive the people by making if he was God? Why would he say you're going to do greater works than me? OK, so then I think you need to rephrase what you're saying because you're saying Jesus deceived. I don't think that's what you meant. You no, know, I'm asking it, you. He yeah. would He's have deceived, deceived because we deceived. can't we can't do yeah. greater work than God. It was clear that he's the son of God. And, right. and if we become sons of God, we could do greater work than he did. But we can't do greater work than God. In that regards, meaning in the sovereignty of God, like creating the expanse of the universe, then I would say, no, we cannot. 100%. I own that. I don't think greater means greater in superseding. I mean, I think greater means greater in capacity. Let me give you an example. When I'm online, when I'm online, I have about a couple of million people watching me at one shot each time I get on. I would say that that's a greater reach to some degree than Jesus had when he was walking Palestine because he was teaching to thousands, yet I'm teaching to millions. That's greater reach. So greater works shall you do. So if I'm, not, I'm not, not greater doing... than him, I'm not greater than Jesus. But if I'm preaching online and a, and a million people are watching me and then the video goes viral a million different ways, in that instant, I'm doing a greater reach or capacity of how I'm reaching people. I would say that it would, to some degree, maybe not in essence of the miracles and the signs and the wonders, I would say it's greater. It's greater, but not better. Is it greater worse than God? Uh, based on the way you're telling me, then I would say, I don't know. I don't know. Because um, now you gave me something to think about. Right on. Do you love white people? Absolutely. You love white people? Yes, I do. What's wrong with the blacks? I don't think there's anything wrong with them. What's wrong with humans? No, but what's wrong with the blacks? Okay, tell me what do you mean by that, and maybe I can answer wh what I think about it. You, in, you, in New York, crime right. out of control, and the blacks yeah. are leading the way in the crime. Blacks okay. are always complaining, and they believe that white people are superior to them because they're always calling white people white supremacy and superior to them. Blacks are angry. The black men don't control the black women. They're subject to the woman. Uh, they want reparations. They want right. affirmative action. They don't want to earn their way anymore. And right. they always complain about the white man. They create ghettos. Everything they touch turn to dust. What's wrong with the blacks? I don't know. And I'm not at the place to say that that's exactly what happens. You don't know that I, that's I, happening? I haven't had enough interaction to ask them. Hey, you don't know about happening. You don't know about affirmative action? I know, I know those things, but I haven't, I don't know many people dealing with that stuff. I haven't met any, well, the blacks in our church, they, they don't come, they're the opposite of what you're saying. So I know that might not, might seem impossible, but the African-Americans that I pastor, they're not complainers. They're not struggling. They're blessed. And you know, when and you they, ask them in you know, your church, what's wrong with the blacks? What do they say? I've never asked them what's wrong with the blacks. Why not? It's never come up. We don't deal with that in our church. Why not? No, they need help. Why don't you deal with it? The blacks in our church have never asked for help because they're very self-sufficient. They've made their way. They've, God has blessed them and they're doing great things. And they never had that whatever mentality that you're talking about doesn't really exist much in our church. So I haven't had that 
whatever it is that you're talking about, low is me or I'm struggling. We don't, we don't deal with that. We don't deal with that in our church. And like, why don't you? I, we just haven't had the opportunity to our members to, I just haven't encountered any of our membership dealing with that. So I'm and not saying why, it doesn't exist. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Right. But then that'd be a little bit naive for me to say that. Yeah. I just haven't seen it. The, the ones in our church, man, they're thriving. They're entrepreneurs. They're making things happen. They're loving life and they serve our leadership and our staff. I just haven't had that encounter yet. I'm not saying it doesn't exist though. And if it did, I don't know how I would answer that. When that time comes, I guess I would do a part two interview and I'd say, I got the answer for that. Uh, they are fewer in numbers in this country, right? 12 to 13% are blacks. Right. And yet they commit most of the violent crime and they are angry. And they, why do you think they commit most of the violent crime and they are so few in number? You know, I don't, I don't know. I would, I could tell you why I did it. I know why I but did it. But you're not black. I'm not asking about you. Then I don't know how to answer that because I thought Latinos were black. I thought we were both black. They don't even like Latinos. Have you that noticed I agree with you. That, that I can agree with you on. There's, <laughs> there's some issues there. That I agree with you with that one. You know what I'm saying? But they hate the, everybody. And, and in the Bronx, why is that? In the Bronx, we're the same. And that's because we birthed, we birthed hip hop. So we have a different view of that. So Latinos and blacks were basically, basically the same. So I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Be very honest with you. Have you know. ever wondered, even though you might not say it out loud, have you ever yeah. wondered why are the blacks so angry and because they were not always that way. They only became that way for the most part when they had the civil rights movement. One right. of other than abortion, the civil rights movement was the worst thing that ever happened to the blacks. Because right. prior to the civil rights movement, black people had fathers and mothers and grandparents and they thought and did for themselves. They right. didn't put some man over them as their leader. But once the civil rights movement happened, they gave up God and put man over them, Jesse Jackson and, and Martin Luther King and all those people. Right. And they have never returned. They've gotten worse instead of better. Do you agree with that? You know, as far as the, the statement on the civil rights, I don't know if I could agree with you on that. But as far as these ministers that you have mentioned, I've rubbed elbows with many of them because I travel the influential circuits. And I would say, yeah, that, that God is absent in a lot of those a lot of those. Um, I would say these influential, not all of them, but these particular influential ministers, as I travel in their green rooms, you could tell that yeah. God, has, God has left the building a long time ago. Long, and yet the blacks follow them. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe tradition. Uh, maybe, oh, maybe culture. Blind? Maybe blind. I, I don't I, I, I don't know. I, I'd let your other guests answer that because I have a pretty multi-diverse congregation. So I, I don't, I don't know, but I would assume culture blind, uh, culture blindness, um, tradition, you know, it's all they, it's all they well, know. It's not tradition because when I was growing up black, the, uh, the blacks were not like that. The blacks were decent. They knew our battle was a spiritual battle. It right. has nothing to do with race. It was about good right. and evil. And it only started when they sold their soul to the, so-called civil rights movement, which is worse, abortion for the blacks or the civil rights movement? No, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> what no the? comment. Why You're not? not? Don't catch me on that one. Because there's no wrong. There's, 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 there's no right answer there. If I say both, you'll say the civil, the civil, the civil, the civil rights movement. If I say the opposite, then there's no answer to that. I, because I, they both is horrific. You're right about that. But I'll let you. Uh, well, allegedly, that's what you say. Uh, what do you mean? Meaning, I'm cleaning my hands on that. I'll let <laughs> you say that. I didn't say that, so I'm not going to get caught up that I said that. You said that, so <laughs> I'm just listening to my host tell me their particular views on that. Um. Oh man, so you can't me catch me. I'm from the Bronx. You can't catch me, sir. Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to catch you. I'm just I'm fellowshipping with you. Okay. We're exchanging ideas. Okay, so that I have the right to say, I'm throwing, I'm throwing it back. Hot potato. I'm throwing it back at you, man. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> what is a man? The word man in the scripture, please excuse if I'm using like, if I'm just Bibled out, you know. The word man in scripture uh, means source. It means progenitor. 
Uh, it means, uh, well, it just means source. It means progenitor. It means the source from which everything flows. It also uh, has the word patter in it. It means where we get the word pattern or pattern maker, which means where we would understand as a role model that sets the pattern. So that would be my biblical definition of the word man. And what is the, love? Theologically. What is theologically. love? Well, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. You're a reverend, so um, I believe you have all of the seven aspects of love found um, in the word eros, agape, philios, um, all of that. So I would say the scripture says the highest definition of love can be found in giving one's life for someone else. I know Romans chapter five says that the highest definition of the word love is laying down one's life for a friend. So I guess ultimate sacrifice. And that's where I, I guess I'd stay there. <laughs> Sorry if that's not the answer you're looking for. No, I'm not. I'm not looking yeah. for a certain answer. I'm just yeah. talking to you. Okay. Just see Let's how you it. think about it. I'm things. enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. When Jesus said that. Uh, I haven't walked off yet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't logged off yet. I'm, I'm from the Bronx. We don't log off. We fight. We, we, we exchange ideas and we, we have, a, I call it a theological bar fight. We have a theological bar fight and afterward we have, we have drinks on the Holy Ghost. All right. Jesus said, um, let no man teach you. Isn't that right. true? Um. Jesus didn't say that. The apostle John said that in 1 John chapter 2. He said, you have the anointing, you have no man to teach you. So Jesus didn't actually say that. John said that. And so when it was said, why do preachers still teach their congregation the word and get them stuck intellectually with the word, which prevent them from ever knowing God? Why do they teach them when it was instructed not to teach? Okay, I don't know if it's based on the instructions of not to teach, but I would say... He said that we have the Holy Spirit and he would bring right. all things to us. He would teach us. That and we that have a teacher within. So why do preachers still teach when they were told not to teach? Okay, so let me... let me. I do agree with you on that because I do teach, I do teach that before the law of Moses, all of the patriarchs had no Bible, yeah. but they had a relationship with God. So what you're saying is I actually do teach that. You know, pre... Pre-Diluvian Noah, Enoch, Adam, Cain, Abel, all of the patriarchs, pre-Diluvian flood, before the law of Moses came, uh, 3,500 years later, um, was dealing Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They were dealing directly with God and God taught them himself and they had a relationship, relationship with God. Now, the reason for the giving of the law it's very simple because of the, the Bible actually tells you because of man's transgressions and sin, because if there's no law given, then I can continuously sin and then use the excuse of you never told me you ain't never tell me. So I'm just going to live this lifestyle. So this is why we find all those Bible stories with some of the most craziest things that ever happened, incest and this and that. Well, they couldn't get condemned for it to some degree because there was no law, no law given. The law was given for transgressors to show us exactly how God wanted us to live. Ideally, it was to live to serve God from the heart, to serve God from the heart, a new heart, a new flesh. I'm going to give you where you have no man to teach you. So I do agree with you on that. But because of sinful nature, the presence of sin still available. I believe pastors and teachers are there to tell us what God doesn't like because we still have a sinful nature. But I do agree with you to some degree that in the beginning, they didn't have they didn't have a Bible. That's amazing. Um, oh, I forgot my thought. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, where is the kingdom of heaven? Is that, a, is that a first that I can say, that I can claim that as a champion, that I, I, I got Reverend <laughs> Jeff to lose his chain of thought? Is that now nah, uh, has that happened before? It's happened before. I it wish I, before. I, I, oh, wish man, I, I wish could I give you that. No, I wish I could give you that. <laughs> where is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven, well, it depends. The kingdom of heaven is the abode of God where God dwells. It's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within inside, with inside human beings where God rules and reigns. So there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It's actually, as a matter of fact, I'm teaching this right now in our church tonight. As soon as I finish this interview, I have to jet to church because I'm actually teaching about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Crazy so, you would ask me that. So there is a, a difference in the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Yes, there's a, there's a vast difference. The kingdom of heaven just means the place where God lives. 
It's just, it's the territory where the king dwells. That's it. The kingdom of heaven. God dwells in heaven. Our father who art in, it doesn't say earth and it doesn't say the heart. Our father who dwells in our hearts. It doesn't say this It's our father who art in, in heaven. Now the kingdom of God is God's governing rulership over a territory. It's kind of like uh, the best way to describe it is when a kingdom dominates a territory and they colonize that territory, they invade that territory with the kingdom or the expression of the kingdom that dominated it, which means that territory acts, lives, moves, and breeds according to the kingdom that dominated But he it. said that the kingdom of heaven is within us. No, he says the kingdom of God is within us. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's he said us. the kingdom of heaven is at hand it's as opposed us. to, no, that's not what he said. He said the kingdom of God is within you. Luke chapter 11, you could go look it up. He never said the kingdom of heaven is within you. He said the kingdom of God. Now he did say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means when he said that, he was saying that I'm here now, I'm bringing the kingdom with me. So now it's at hand. At hand means it's close. It doesn't mean that it's there. It means it's close. So it means the kingdom of God is near. I'm looking okay. at the clock here, so I got to ask, do you believe that, do you believe that racism exists? Yes, I do. And where's your proof that racism exists? You know, I've seen it. Um, well, I've seen some variations of it uh, as I was growing up um, based on um, my interactions with particular uh, individuals. I've seen it even within my own people. And what does it look racist. like? What does it look uh, like? What does racism look like? I believe it's the superiority of one race feeling that they're superior over another. And then um, withholding any, I guess, I don't know how to explain it after that, other than one race feeling superior over another. And then everything that has to do with our interactions as a human species between one another, um, those decisions being either limited or completely expunged based on that superiority mindset that a person that and, a person would have. Well, I've seen variations of it. I, I, now, I'll be honest with you. I have not seen the harshnesses of it that we've seen during the civil rights era and all of that. I haven't seen it to that degree with the lynching. I wasn't alive at that time. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, all I know is what was told to me. But I know what I have seen as far as how it was projected towards me as Brown um, living in New York. I seen it in prison. I seen it with my own Latinos being racist with blacks and whites. And then I seen blacks being racist with Latinos and whites. So I've seen it based on interactions with the people that I've dealt with growing up, but I haven't seen it in the fullness of the historical context of it with the lynching and the, and the fire hoses. I haven't seen it not in that degree. So if, if racism is the, the, uh, one race believe it's superior to the other, that means that all people would be racist because all races believe they're, all color people believe their their race is superior to the other, somebody else's race. So are you saying that all people are racist? I would say there's a difference between racism and patriotism, all right? Because I'm proud to be Afro-Latino, but I wouldn't think Afro-Latino was superior than any other race, but, but I would be proud are, to be Latino. But it, people in your race think that they're superior to others. People yes, in the do. black race and people in the yes, white race. So you're yeah. saying all people are racist there? No, I'd say some people, the ones that think like that, they're the racist ones. Amazing. In my, in my race, though, in my race. And I would honestly say that it does exist. To sit here and say it doesn't exist, I'd be lying to you. Or well, I'm just trying to evade the ans answering the question. It does exist in- Does in God America. say racism exists? You know, I believe there's one verse that actually talks about that, but I wouldn't know if it is racism per se, but it does talk about the dealings, the dealings with foreign nations and how God dealt with foreign nations and how, or rather how the children of Israel was to deal with, with foreign nations. But he if never he, said racism. There's nowhere in the Bible where yeah, it says racism. The word racism. itself is not. The word, that's why I said the word itself, the word God, itself is not. The, God the said mannerisms that. might be to some degree because Song of Solomon talks about um, where she was describing that her fellow light-skinned people were judging her and ostracizing her because she was dark-skinned. So that's the only verse in the Song of Solomon that kind of can maybe indicate that there was racism at that time. Also, the fact that being mad that Moses potentially married a Cushite 
could be a form of racism depending on how you look at that verse. So I would say it could be, but the word itself is not in the, that word itself is not in the Bible. God said that we wrestle not against right. flesh and blood, but against right. spirits and principalities right. That's and my wickedness realm. in evil places. Yeah. So being Love a it. preacher of God, why would you say that it's racism when you know that it's a, uh, it's a battle between good and evil? You're either right or you're wrong, and it has nothing to do with the physical at all but it's the spirit. Why would you call it something other than that? Um, because it's not its not all just right or wrong when it comes to that. It's Again, either right or it's wrong. No, that's not how you're it goes. You're either of good or you're of evil. Okay, now that, yes. But, but that's a trick That's a trick answer. You're gaslighting it. You're how that trick answer? Right or wrong mean good and evil? No, because if you're saying, if we wrestle not against flesh and blood, then if, it, if it's like that, then nobody should go to jail for wrongdoing. Because then I could, they could say, hey, my brother, it's battle of flesh and blood. Ah, you see what I'm saying? We take people to jail because it's not just a battle of flesh and blood. Baby, you're going to jail, man, if you did this thing. That's because if we have like evil that, people. We would excuse make, ourselves from actions. See? That's because we have evil people making and, and uh, <laughs> pushing the laws. Okay. So let me ask. I can't fight you on that, man. At that point, I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> and so in our country today, the people of color. <laughs> and especially the blacks, the people right. of color, are trying to run the <laughs> white man out of his own country. We all agree that America was founded and created by white people with the help of God. And right. because of that, everybody else came. So the blacks and others are trying to run the white man off of his own land. Is that racism? Right. First, let's deal with, I think we... Oh, man. This is this is a conquered land, so it's not a white land. It is a predominantly white land now. So, but it's it's but it's a conquered land. So it's it's. Let me just say this: it's really a red land. It's a red land. So let's just know. own that. What did right? that mean? But it's, a, red but it's land. a white land now. Okay, so given it's a white land now, the red can't complain. They got dominated. You have to rise up as a people and take over. When and you take say it back. red, are you talking about the Indians? Yes. Oh. So but, is that racism? Let me answer your question before you go, before you get to the, before you get to the, before you get to the other stuff. Okay. So now that it is predominantly white based on the tenets of our U.S. constitution, let me just say this, that I'm with you on that. I love this country. I believe in America. I don't believe in critical race theory that this country was inherently founded upon evil. Yeah. I believe the founding of this country had evil people in it who were more theists rather than Christians. But nevertheless, I'm proud to be an American, 100%. You so know? It, is it yeah. racist then that the, the colored people are trying to run the white man off his own land? Is that racist? They are outwardly discriminating against the whites in every area now. Is that racism? I believe it's, I don't think it's racism, but I do believe it's feeling uh, indebted to take back the rights that were taken from them, being that this country was supposed to give everyone free rights. I believe they feel that there's an injustice that so, they're trying to just to, so you're to saying justice that, for. You're saying that the blacks trying to throw white people off their own land, that's not racism? I don't know how to answer that because I don't know collectively, if that's what they're doing. You know that's, that's what they're doing, man. What the, you hear about it all the time now. I hear about it all the time, but the biggest false prophet that there is is the media. So I don't believe everything the media says. Well, you can believe right. that. It's true. Okay. So if you tell me it's true, okay. So is I'll that racism? I don't know. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that because I don't yes, know. Yes, you do. No, I, no. Okay, let me just say this. I actually don't. I live in a realm of, the realm that I come from, you know, Reverend Jess, is this. I'm going to be very you honest with you. You just call me Jesse. Jesse. That's my dad's name, just to let you know. No, you tell him, him I said, what's up? All right. He's going to watch this. That's his name. Actually, about, hey, you Jesse. Me. Nice name. <laughs> okay. I, I'm just going to be very honest with you. I come from the streets, so I grew up with a different narrative. I grew up with, a, I don't care about nobody but myself. That, that, so I, I didn't have nobody else in mind. I didn't have nobody but now else you, in mind. But now you, because of time, now, now you're I a preacher. Do. 
Why can't you see that the blacks doing that to the whites is racist if you believe racism exists? Because my understanding is evolving based on interaction and learning. I'm still learning. I'm I'm trapped in this church world. I get saved. I'm from street life. Don't care about nobody. I get saved and I've been in church. And then now I'm growing 20 years in and I I interact with situations. My knowledge is upgrading. I don't know where my knowledge will be 10 years from now. Maybe this conversation might change. If the whites were trying to get rid of the black people off their land, would that be racism? According to how our black African-American brothers in their mindset and how the things that they deal with, I would say in their mindset, they would probably say yes. Would you say that would be racism? I don't know how to answer that. Amazing. (laughs) (laughs) This has been a a really good conversation. This has been a really good conversation. Amazing. Uh, did you vote for the great white hope the first time around? Yes, I did. And would you vote for him again? More than likely, I probably will. Right on. Yeah. Amazing. I, I, I'm not I'm not ashamed to say that me and my house and a large percentage of our leadership in our church, not all, most of us are Trump supporters. Not all are Trump supporters in our house. That's the uniqueness of what God is doing. In our house, we have both Democrats and Republicans, and both of them have voted according to their conscience. Amazing. But you made your wife vote the way you vote, right? No, she voted according to how she wanted to vote. But you don't make her go. But but, but both of us voted. We're both the same. Oh, okay. Um, I got to heat this interview up, so I need to put you on the hot seat. (laughs) Put me on the hot seat. Make it the most controversial that you can. Uh, okay, on the hot seat, and I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Okay, let's do it. The hot seat. True or false, President Trump is the best thing to come out of New York City. False. Did you take the jab? No. Have you ever gone way beyond yonder? It, to meet my Lord, yes. <laughs> uh, do you believe in climate change? Yes and no. Are you a nationalist? I would say yes. I believe in this country, yes. Is it evil for a parent to bring a step-parent into the lives of their children? No. True or false, abortion is worse than slavery? No comment. Um, <laughs> you're not going to catch me with that one. Is abortion evil? Yes. Is Joe Biden the worst president you've ever seen? I don't know. That's what? yet to be determined. I don't know. Is Who is worse as president? The fallen Messiah, Barack Obama, or Joe Biden? I would probably say Joe Biden. Why is Camilla Harris so shallow? She has nothing on the inside. I can't speak to that, but she could. She could seem pretty shallow. Uh, I've seen. I've seen. I've seen it. Did Don't Big know. Did Big Mama Michelle eat all the ribs? <laughs> probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should felons be allowed to vote? Yes. One hundred percent. Speaking as an ex-felon, yes. Did you have fun? All I'm going to say is amazing. I had an amazing time. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was fun, man. Thanks for coming on. Tell the (laughs) folks how to get to your website, your ministry, or whatever you're doing out there. Well, very easy. You can look us up on YouTube, social media, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, everywhere, Instagram, as Alexander Pagani Ministries. The links will probably be in the description of this video. If you enjoyed good theological Bible teaching and just great good commentary on whatever's on my mind, feel free to look us up. Thank you for having me on, sir. I look forward to doing a part two with this in the next couple of years, and maybe my my narrative might change in some areas. Absolutely. I really appreciate you coming on, and thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget that the Father State is now on Locals.com. Click the link in the description to support our work and you can be a um you can be a, a channel membership of, of the father state so on the youtube channel there we thank you for it and let me hear from you thank you again for coming on i totally appreciate it man 
Thank you for having me on, sir. Right on. Amazing.